worship. Sing. Don't worry. If I'm out to you, you sing for me. Okay? Everybody, let's go.
intercessors like the Holy Spirit, the angels, will sit together with us. We are practicing for heaven. Church, we are practicing for heaven. This is our rehearsal. This is our practice for heaven. So sing. Sing to the Lord tonight. Sing to the Lord. I just want to read a few scriptures about Good Friday. Yes. Now, what's so good about Friday? What's so good when Jesus had to die? I'm going to read this from Mark 9, verse 31. Because he was teaching his disciples, he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. Mark chapter 10. Who will mock him and spit on him? Flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Amen. Isaiah 53 said, But because of our sins, he was wounded, beaten because of the evil we did. We are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. And in Romans 5, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. Now verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us. In this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's read one more time. This verse, one more time. This is how God loves us. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this is why Good Friday is good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
come in our own different ways, our own special ways, oh God. Lord, tonight we would just want to thank you for you have made a way for us to be able to come before you in this simple manner. Oh Lord, to see you face to face, oh God. That when you are hung on the cross, the veil is torn, oh God. That we can walk through it and approach you, oh Lord. That our sins are washed away, oh Lord. Lord, we thank you. We truly don't understand how much it's cost you, oh God. But we thank you, oh God. You have made it all for us, oh Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just worship him. Let's just sing unto him. Let's just give our hearts to him tonight. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we praise you. Come on. Just give thanks to God for a moment where you are. Just what a wonderful time of worship. Just lift up your hand up where you are right now. Just give thanks to Him. Thank you, Lord, for the cross of Calvary. Thank you, Lord, for the shed blood. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for walking that journey, Lord, so that we can have life, life abundant. Oh, thank you, Lord, for taking the cup of sin, oh, Father, Lord. So today we can stand before you and say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we adore you. Lord, we glorify you. As you stand before the Lord right now, I just want to lift up your hand before God and you just want to pray for your loved ones at this very moment. I think you should do that. Just lift up your loved ones, your family members who do not know the Lord yet. Come lift them up into the hand of the Lord right now. Because that is the message the Lord has for you and for me today that he wants to see your loved ones coming to Jesus. Amen. The word of God says, me and my household shall serve the Lord. Me and my household shall serve the Lord. Oh, lift them up to the Lord right now. Bring them to the Lord's presence. Come on. Pray for your family members, your loved ones, your brothers, your sisters, your husband, your wife, your children. Come on, bring them to the Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, touch them, oh Father, Lord. Even as we stand, oh God, at this time to glorify you, to magnify you, Lord, we remember them. We ask for your mercy to come upon them, oh God. Lord, we know, Lord, some are hardened in their hearts, some are slow to accept you, Lord. Lord, we come against all those hindrances. We tear them down in Jesus' name. And as we stand today, Lord, as a people of God, we pray for salvation upon our loved ones. Touch them, O oh Father, Lord. Bring them. Let their eyes be open, O oh God, to know that you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. And to know, Lord, you are the God of all eternity, Lord. Lord, we pray for salvation of our loved ones, O oh God. Lord, salvation even for our nation, O oh God, that we belong to. Lord, we say thank you for this privilege we have to be in your presence. Lord, we love you, we adore you, we praise you. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Oh, Father, we bring the rest of the service in your hand. Bless you, the Father. May the power of God, may the glory of God flow in the midst of us. In the name of Jesus, we pray now. As God, we say, amen, amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Oh, I'm blessed today. How many of you blessed with the worship today? Come on, give God a clap off. Man. Hallelujah. God bless you, Sister Shea and the team. Thank you very much. God is a good God. How many of you can say amen to that? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I mean, what we do is we collect the offering first because later we have communion. Maybe we can take some time to pray. All right. Can I get you... Ashes is to come. Let's collect this evening offering. All right, this is giving unto the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we praise you. We adore you. We glorify you, Lord. That you are all to us, oh Father, Lord. That you are all to us. Lord, you are everything to us, Lord Jesus. Lord, we stand before you. We praise your mighty name. We glorify you. Lord, we pray that you will bless every giving today, Lord. Some are done online. Some are done today, Lord Jesus. Whatever manner that is given today, Lord, you honor every one of them. The word says, oh God, you bless the cheerful givers. Let the joy of God, let the presence of God, let the might of God come upon them even as they give. Thank you, Lord, for this giving of your people. In the name of Jesus, we pray and ask. Amen. God bless you even as you give. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord.
prepared by the young people, by the church, uh, adult, young adults, they are coming to sing. And let's come and just celebrate God's goodness over our life. Amen. I'll start this morning with the, uh, sorry, this evening, all right? This evening, I know, just now everybody wish you good morning and all that. So, I mean, so excited, all right, today to be in the house of God. You know, I was a little bit concerned, Lord, would there be people coming today? But praise the Lord, seeing you all, it's really encouragement. I want to tell you that, come on, give God a clap offering, all right? You are, you did a wonderful thing by coming today. God will certainly honor you and bless you, amen? Yeah, praise the Lord. Can you put the projector up? Is it, is it up? Ah, thank you very much, yeah. This uh, Philip Brook, Philip Brook is the one who wrote a song uh, called Little Town of Bethlehem. He's the guy who wrote it in somewhere around 90, uh, I think 18, 1835, 1835 or 1868, something like that. And he said this very powerfully, he said this, we may say that one of the first uh, Good Friday afternoon was complete, that great act by which light conquered darkness and goodness conquered sin. That is the wonder of our savior crucifixion. Uh, we may say that one of the first Good Friday afternoons was complete, the great act of which light uh, and conquered darkness. So as we celebrate this Good Friday, we are reminded very clearly that light came and conquered darkness. And one of the questions that always... Blood, when this man gets beaten up and, and nailed on the cross, how can a good Friday be good? Now that's something that we're going to listen to the word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. So at the end of the time, at the end of the message, we're able to give the idea of why good Friday is good. Now, the, before we go there any further, we have to go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 26. To give a clear understanding of why good Friday is good, we have to go back to Genesis, chapter 1, verse 26. The Bible says, that God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish, over the sea, and over the bird, over the air, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Here was a word given by the Lord over mankind, and the word is given was dominion. Now this is very important for us to understand because this is why we need Jesus to come to save us, to redeem us, because there's something that happened in the Garden of Eden that lost our position, our title, our empowerment that God has given to us. Why? Because dominion in Hebrew simply means rada. It simply means to rule, to dominate, or to treat down, or to govern. So when the Lord says he has given the man dominion, that means the Lord reminds you and us is to rule. We are called to rule. We are called to dominate. We are called to treat down, we are called to govern. But in the Garden of Eden, there was this devil that he came to confuse mankind and to weaken mankind. And they came and to twist the truth of God and to twist the plan of God. Now, very important for us to understand this because in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, you can read the whole thing about the fall of man. So that is where. The whole story came where Eve was alone. Some people say she was alone. I believe she's not alone. I believe Adam was beside Eve. <laughs> Many of them tend to blame her, but I believe there was nothing beautiful in the garden beside Eve. All right? So I guarantee you Adam was just beside her. But uh, this devil took over this body of an animal and decided to deceive Eve. And by asking you a few questions, did God say this? Did God say this to you? <laughs> and it's always how the devil come to cheat you, to lie to you, by questioning you back. Did God say this? Of course, God didn't say to Eve, but right? God only said to who? Adam. God didn't say anything to Eve. God only said to Adam, do not touch the fruit of this tree. You can eat anything you want, but do not touch the fruit of this tree. Leave this thing alone. Do whatever you want. Leave this tree alone. Don't touch it. But that instruction was given to Adam. And of course, Adam was there and saw what was Eve doing. But Adam didn't stop. And you and I know, at the end of the day, they fall. And Adam blamed the woman who God had given has caused him the fall. But this is where we know very clearly that this obedience came in the Garden of Eden. Now, from here, we're able to learn a few words. This obedience caused the fall. 
The instruction was given by God to Adam. Adam, don't touch the fruit. Don't touch the tree. Adam supposed to tell you, Eve, Eve, don't do it. But nothing happened. Disobedient stepped into the Garden of Eden. And very interestingly to find out, disobedient in Hebrew word is called rebellion. When you look at the scripture, when the Bible says disobedient, in Hebrew it's called rebellion. Now, the word rebellion is interesting. The word rebellion is called sin. The word rebellion in Hebrew is called sin. So when rebellion takes place in a garden Eden, sin stepped in and caused that trouble. So what we understand from here is disobedience is rebellion to God's known will. And it is called sin. God gave instruction to Adam, do not touch that tree. If you touch, you will surely die. Don't do it. Knowing what God has spoken to Adam, Adam didn't hear it. Adam went against it, disobeyed God, and he fall into sin. And in man's disobedience, God's word activated. What happened? In man's disobedience, God's word activated the power of death with sin. Death has no power. Without sin, there was no power. Now let's look at the scripture. Many of us, we read the scripture many times, but we have not seen one of the truth in the scripture. What the Bible says, Jesus said to Adam, Genesis chapter 12, 16 to 18, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For it is the day that you eat from it you will surely die. So what happened? Surely die. God already spoken the word. When God said the word in the garden Eden, the devil was in the garden. The devil was hearing the conversation. So the devil went to Eve and said, did God say that to you? But Eve never take it seriously. Eve and Adam never took the whole thing seriously. They obeyed God. When they ate the fruit of the tree, the word of God that spoken activated. And that's where death activated. That's where death activated. Because the Lord says, if you eat, you will die. If you eat, you will die. Because when the Lord speak, the word will come to life. As long as they did not touch the fruit, they will leave. That's the reason why the Lord has to get out Adam and Eve out of the garden because they were the tree of life. If Adam and Eve would have eaten the tree of life, Adam and Eve would have been eternally dead. And God stood there and said, you are not coming in the garden, Eden. Get out of the house, this garden. And the Lord put two angels to block them to enter into that garden again. Why? Because God had a redemptive plan to save mankind after death. And I will go on sharing a little bit more on that. And God has that message for you and for me today. So, in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to 15 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, thus death spread to all men because of all sin, just through Adam and Eve, sin came into the world. And that sin overtook mankind. So today we are living in this nature of sin. This sin is lingering. Even how much you want to do. That's what Paul says. I want to do what I want to do, but I cannot do because my mind is sinful. I'm living in sin. That's the reason why we need the Lord Jesus. To, that is the reason why the Lord sent the Holy Spirit to be with us, to be our paraclete, to comfort us, to teach us how to behave, what must we do and how we must speak. In fact, in the book of Scripture, let me just go, I'll go back to that later. Good Friday is Jesus dealing with the source of the power of death. And what is the source of power of death? It's basically sin. He was dealing with sin. He was dealing with sin that has happened because of rebellion and disobedience that took place in the Garden of Eden. And because of that rebellion, because of that wrong, death activated and grief come into the picture. Now we don't need to teach our children to sin, you know. I still remember when my children were growing up, when they make mistake, you know, I asked them, who did this? Very important, very quickly they point finger to somebody else. 
Hey, you don't tell a child this is wrong. Or, no, they just know sin already inbuilt in you. In order to teach someone to lie, they already know how to do it. <laughs> it's built in them. And that's why sin is what we call rebellion. What is rebellion? Is disobedient to God's word. So what did Adam and Eve did? He rebelled against God because he didn't hearken to the word of God. And that's why rebellion takes place. Today we see in the world, rebellions are everywhere. We see how mankind are rebelling against God, how the homosexual, how the LGBT, how those people out there are rebelling against God. And, and I'm surprised to see some news where people are going and, and, this, this, and, and, and putting the name of Jesus like as if he's a rubbish, insulting what he has done and questioning the resurrection of Jesus. They are just coming to devour God divine word over our life so that you can, so that they can put him so be in your heart and when that comes in, you rebel against God. And that's the biggest fear we have in the last days because the Bible says even the noble will be deceived. Who are the nobles? The leaders. Who are the nobles? The board members. Who are the nobles? The pastors. Who are the nobles? Those who know the scriptures. They can also be deceived in the last days. Because that's what's going to happen as we travel in the world. But one thing the Lord did was if you read in Philippians chapter 2, the Lord Jesus did something powerful. Though he was a God, he submitted to God's plan. He obeyed God. He took down all his throne, power, and authority and allowed himself to submit to the plan of God. You can read that in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 onwards. You can find how he stood down to be a man. When he went to the Garden of Eden, he stood, when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, sorry, he stood there, he cried to God, Father, remove this cup, remove this cup away, remove. When in one bag he saw the disciple was sleeping, he told the disciple, hey, 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 young, hey, brothers, listen, don't let the devil overtake you. Don't allow temptation to overtake you. When he heard that, he ran back to God and he cried to God, Father, let thy will be done. Let thy will be done. Because that cup of sin was a cup of the universe, cup of eternity. All the sin of the world is coming upon him. But the Lord submitted. What Adam did was rebel against God, but God through Jesus submitted to the purpose of God and purpose of redemption. So Good Friday is a road to Sunday where we see resurrection. Sunday is when we see death is put to death. Sunday is where you see death is put to death. So what does sin do? What does sin do in our life? What does sin do in our life? Number one, he separates us from God. If the enemy wants to come against you, he put a lie in your ears, he put a lie in your eyes, he put a lies, and the lie will come and work in you, just like how Eve received the lie that you will become like God. The devil say you will become like God. You know why God doesn't want to do it? Because you become like God. You become like God. That's why the devil doesn't want you to eat this. Because you will start thinking like God. Is it true? Yes, to a certain extent. Today we see men as who want to become like God. They want to be a God. And they separate us from God. And that's why the Lord came to deal with that area that we were able to touch this God of eternity. I still remember when I was preaching in a Pakistani service. One Muslim guy came and sit down with him. How can God have a son? How can God bring, give birth to a child? How can this God in heaven come down? I look at the guy and say, listen, let me ask you a question. You live in Pakistan, you build your house on your own, am I right? Just imagine you got a piece of land, you got a big, huge land, and you decided to build a house. What would you do? See, I'll get a right fella, I get a contractor, I might get a good guy to come alongside to draw me the plan. I say, okay, once you build the whole house, you move in the house. After many years, you move in the house. Now suddenly you woke up in the morning, you see one of your walls of your house have a patch of water. What will you do? He said, I'll fix the problem. I said, fine, how will you fix the problem? I'll get the right person to come and fix it. I said, would you get any other contractors to come and fix it? No, I'll go back to the guy who designed my house. I said, fine, so what will you do? The designer will come, open up the blueprint and say, oh, I know there's a pipe there. And they will deal with that one mistake or one broken pipe without hacking the whole wall. Am I right? He said, yes, only that portion. I said, look at him. I said, who is our designer? Who is our designer? Who mold you? Who made you? Who make you to be who you are? 
How can a designer speak from a distant past? He has to come down to walk with you and to walk with me and to speak to me and to show me how the way to come back to God because there is nobody else can show me the way back to God. Only he has to come down. And the only way he can come down is through a woman. He cannot come down like an alien. He cannot come down like a stranger standing open up and the door. He can't because he do that is illegal. He has to come down legally through a woman. When I said this to him, he kept quiet for a while. He went back to sit on the chair. Of course, I spoke to him more than that. After the service over, I was about to leave. He walked to me, hold my hand. He said, listen, me and my family want to give our life to Jesus. I said, praise the Lord. And only his family came to the Lord. The whole family, they came down from Pakistan, gave their life to Jesus in Malaysia. My brother, my sisters, uh, the Lord come to deal with us because sin will separate you from God. Number two, what happened? Number two. It makes you feel guilty. Sin always makes you feel guilty. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. They went and hide. When the Lord came in the cool of the evening, see, Adam, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? He was hiding. They were hiding. Then the Lord says, why are you hiding? Oh, we are naked. The Lord says, how come you are naked? Sin always makes you guilty. When someone lives a sinful life, they always feel guilty. That's what the devil does. He puts guilt in your heart, and guilt is the one that brings you away from the purpose and the plan of God over your life. Sin always cripple you by putting lies, and many of them feel guilty, and they walk away, and they say, oh, I cannot come to Christian faith because I'm bad, I'm no good. My good news to you is God didn't come to look for good and fine and better person. God come to look for those who are sinful and broken and who have lost their ways. How many of you say amen to that? He come to look for the guilty and the broken. We are not living in a religion. We are living in a relationship. Hallelujah. He come to bring that relationship, that conversation once again, that connection which was broken. He wants to mend once again. And one of the areas that stop us to have this communication with God is guilt. As I tell to people, whatever sin you are suffering, don't allow it to hold you down. Come to God. That's why David cried unto God. And David said, when he was exposed about the sin that he's committed, he never ran and killed the prophet. He never ran and closed everything down. No, he ran to God and said, God, only you I have sinned. Forgive me, cleanse me, wash me, make me pure. Take me not away from your presence. Cast not your Holy Spirit away from me. Sin make you guilty. Sin allows you, allows the Satan to accuse you. The devil is very active, yeah, for your information. Let me tell you that some of you think, oh, I don't believe in devil. Believe me, look around, you can see some. They're very active. The devil is a very active person. Read the line of the book of Job, what the devil was doing. He was going in and out of the world. And God asked him, what are you doing? He said, I'm going in and out of the world, looking who I can devour. The devil is out there to accuse you, so do not be happy. And don't become the agent of devil to accuse someone because God doesn't want you to be there. He's accuser. He is an accuser of the brother. On the day you face God face to face, the devil is there in the throne room of God too. He will accuse you. He say, I am this guy. Remember the story how he accused Moses? How he accused Abraham? He accused Moses of only the stone. He took his staff and hit the rock by spitting it. He accused, he said to who? To the angel, Michael, I want this body because this body has sinned against God by doing one mistake. He's accuser. The angel Michael was very smart. He turned to the devil and said, what? My God rebuke you, why? Because angel Michael know that this devil is more powerful than he is, but he need a greater power to overcome this devil. And he said, my God will accuse you, brother. Brother and sister, there is a realm of the spirit today fighting in the world. Let me tell you, things are not getting as good as you think. Ah, Israel is having a lot of war going on. Battle is going on. Open your eyes to see. Because we do not know when the coming of the Lord will be. There are things are happening out there. Don't get yourself so hidden. Open your eyes to see. The Lord says, 
That's why the Lord says, when you pray, open your eyes, don't close your eyes. Many of us, we pray, we close our eyes, why? Because we're scared, what will people think? Open your eyes! I'm telling you that, I, I receive videos about how things are being against the body of Christ. Satan is accusing. Number four, he demands a death penalty on your life. When you sin, you have allowed death penalty to come over your life. You allow death penalty to take over you. My brother, my sister, do not take things thing lightly because you living in this world is very small, very short, very short while. That's all you have. That's all you have in this world, very short. Let me show you this one more time. Some of you look at me and say, Pastor, what are you saying? Now, let me tell you. I saw this illustration and I like it very much. Your life on earth since you are born is up to here to here. You born, the day you walk up from your mother's womb, is up to here to here. That's where your life on earth is. But your life is not end. Your life ends. Look at this. Eternally. You've got a long life to live after you die. But many of us, we take time to think about this. How to behave, how to talk, what to say, what not to say. What must I do? What must I eat? Where? Oh, yeah. Where I spend my eternity? Nobody think about it here. Where am I going to spend after I die? Nobody think about it here. But you forget, there's life. Once you die, comes judgment. Once you leave this planet Earth, it's over. You will meet that judge who will judge you for good. Once you leave this planet Earth, Jesus is no more loving, but he's a judge. He's loving at this moment. But when you enter to eternity, he's no more loving. He's a judge. He will correct, wanting to be corrected. So the devil come to put sin in our mind, in our heart. So that the penalty will be death. That's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have seen. God have ascended. We have fall that standard. And the glory of God is there. We are here. But we cannot reach to the glory. We cannot come there. That's why Jesus has to come. Because we cannot go up there. We are already down here. We cannot go up there because we are condemned by sin. We cannot go up there. That's why Jesus has to come and to walk the journey and to die for us on the cross of Calvary. Because the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He is our gift. How many of you can say amen to that? As we celebrate this Good Friday, we celebrate the gift of salvation. We celebrate the gift of redemption. Oh, we celebrate the gift of salvation and redemption because on the cross of Calvary, there was a cross over, cross over, cross over. What was belong to us went on Jesus. What is ours went on Jesus. And what is on Jesus went on us. There was a cross over of God's blessing upon our life because Jesus has given us eternal life. What the Bible says, now, this is very powerful. As I say, I'll tell you a little bit more about this. This truth is more important. He said what? I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. This was mentioned in the Garden of Eden. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Listen, the virgin birth of Jesus was already mentioned here. Jesus never, God never said, between you and the man. He said between you and a woman. Here clear cut to show you that the virgin birth of Jesus was already declared in the Garden of Eden. That's the reason why the devil was not happy. The devil was always killing every baby since the time he knew about this. And you see the whole history of the Bible, a amount of children have been killed to stop that seed to come and destroy him. I will put enmity between you and the woman. That woman who come will be one who delivering a child, a seed that will come to break your seed, Satan. You have a seed that you planted, the seed of disobedience, the seed of rebellion, the seed of sin that you planted in Adam and Eve. It's okay, God says, no problem. I will send a seed and that seed will crush your head and bruise you. That seed will crush your head and bruise you. 
He shall bruise your head and shall bruise his heel. God is predicting now, God is prophesying how Jesus will defeat Satan on the cross of Calvary. And how many of you watched the movie Passion of Christ? Have you had a chance to watch the movie? I think Mel Gibson brought the truth so well. And the day when Jesus looked up to the heaven and said, it is finished. As soon as he said that a devil stood there, suddenly, suddenly he realized, oh no, he has become the engineer to fulfill God's redemption plan. My dear brothers and sisters, the Lord came to bruise the enemy. Oh, that's what today you must understand. The devil is walking with a damaged face. He has a damaged face, but because the Bible says he's an angel of light, the light shines too bright. So when you see him, you don't see the damaged face. You only see the light. Light shines, he's an angel of light. He's bright, he's beautiful, but he's basically living a very damaged life. And what does he do? He wants to damage you too. So he comes with all kind of life to damage you, to kill you, to destroy you. Oh, my beloved ones, the birth of Jesus was prophesied in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15. So what we learn here, let me end up here early here. Number one, God revealed his good character. Hallelujah. God reveals his wonderful character. He revealed who he is. He revealed what he is. What he said. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 verse 8, God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While you were still a sinner, Christ died for us. While you're still living in wrong, while you're allowing the devil to kill you, to destroy you, Jesus died for you. In advance, the Lord has fulfilled his will upon your life. In fact, another version, another scripture says this very powerfully. He who did not spare his own son but gave up for us all will also graciously give us all things. Here the Lord shows you his own son. When God, when, when Christ was hung on the cross of Calvary, he cried to God, he said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? Because out of the whole life of Jesus on earth, there was a conversation between the Father and Son, but right on the cross, there was silence. God became silent. Heaven became silent. Everything became quiet. Oh God, oh God, why have you forsaken me? That moment, God turned his head. Some people say, I don't know he turned his head or not. I believe God was looking at his son. But that must be done so the redemption can take place over our lives. Some say God turned his head. I don't think so. He did. He was looking. He was looking at his son. And that death of the son, Jesus, on the cross of Calvary opened up the door of redemption. <laughs> opened up the door of redemption. He never allowed Oh, that death on the cross of Calvary opened up the door of life, life abundant. In fact, that whole experience on the cross of Calvary, when they pierced him on his side, it was a water burst out of him. It's like a woman giving birth to a child. The water came out. At the very moment, the Lord gave birth to the church of God, to the body of Christ. He gave birth to you and to me. He brought his plan accomplished on the cross of Calvary. That's the reason why we, the church, are called to carry the message of Jesus. We are called to carry the message of Jesus. Even Jesus said this. There's a story about how he was talking to the Samaritan woman, and suddenly the disciple came back and said, Jesus, you hungry? And Jesus said, no, 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 I'm not hungry. I'm not hungry because my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Why he wasn't hungry? Because that woman accepted the truth of God. And she got her salvation. And that whole thing made Jesus filled up. He said, I'm no more hungry because someone has come to know the mercy of God over their life. But dear brothers and sisters, oh, the Lord is so much of love over your life. His love is over your life. He wants to bless you to walk with you and to allow his will to be done upon your life. Number three, number two, living without condemnation. When you receive the Lord, you live without condemnation. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 to 6, there is no condemnation now of those who live in union with Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit which brings us life into union with Christ Jesus has sent me free, set me free from the law of sin and death. So once you come to know Jesus, there is no more condemnation over your life. That's why the book of John chapter 3 verse 17 says, for God didn't send his son to condemn you, but to save you through Jesus. There is no more condemnation. But today we have people in the church still feel condemned. I'm no good. 
I cannot pray. I cannot give. I can't do this. No, brothers and sisters. God is not here to condemn you. God is here to elevate you. God is here to be your lifter of your head. He wants to see you stronger and walk in the will of the Father. No condemnation. The woman, the woman who came and thrown by the, by the, by the Jewish people, they threw this prostitute to, to Jesus' feet. Say, according to the law of Moses, this woman should be stoned to death. Oh, this woman should be stoned to death. Jesus looked at them. And look at the woman, and look at them, and look at the woman. She went, he went out right to the woman, and look at the woman's eyes. And he got up, and looked at the man. And he said, if none of you here have sinned, cast your first stone. But what he did next, he went down again. And he stood with the woman. Why? Because if there was a stone thrown, if there was a stone thrown, and that stone is thrown on him, then that man has committed sin. Therefore, he has a right to stone that man. At that very moment, Jesus protected the woman. And because of that, every man dropped the stone and walked away. Because they know if they would have done that, they have sinned. Jesus protected the woman and turned to him and said, Where is your accuser? None of them. Now please go. You are free. Sin no more. Please go. You are free. Sin no more. There's no condemnation in Jesus. How many of you can say amen to that? If you're living your life, Feeling condemned, that is not God, that is the devil. The devil wants to condemn you, the devil wants to stop his best in your life. You know, see, you know, when there were anger and all kind of squabble and fight, but on that day God showed his mercy upon us. That's the reason why. If you understand in the covenant of God, in the, in, the, in the Ark of Covenant, one of the most important elements in the Ark of Covenant is a mercy seat. And the priest will go out every time into this, go into this holy of holy and carry that blood of the Lamb and will pour on that Ark and the blood must touch that mercy seat. When the blood touch the mercy seat, the whole camp will have incense coming up. And people who are outside there, they are watching, they are looking. Once you see the incense going up, they know the sacrifice is accepted. On the cross of Calvary, when Jesus died, that blood fell on the mercy seat. And what happened? The whole temple was shaken. The curtain was torn from the top to down because that is the redemption of God's mercy upon us. That's why we ask you today, what is more important, mercy or grace? With that mercy came grace. With that mercy came grace. With that you get your renewed life. This whole journey of Good Friday is to live a renewed life. Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, For those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on a wing like an eagle. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not be faint. You have renewal just like an eagle. When eagle want to go to the process of metamorphosis, the eagle goes up to the highest mountain, stood on the highest mountain, and fix his eyes to the sun. And you know the whole process, the eagle will not move until every part of the body is become bota. He will become most ugliest eagle. And one by one will start to grow again. The beak will start to come out. The head, all the wing was, everything will start to grow again. And he will still stood low there, watching, watching the sun. And he will hear, now his eyes become sharper. Next thing, his ears become sharper. And he started to hear the wind. When the wind blows, his eyes watches his wind. And when the time comes, he opens up his wing. And he glides in the wind. My brother, my sister, even in our journey as you go in your life, you get you get weak. You lose energy. You get tired. You get exhausted. Some people come to me and say, Pastor, when Jesus is coming up, you sure Jesus is coming up? I've been hearing it from the day when I was born. The day my mother poked me in the pulpit and said, um, come on, I already hear about Jesus coming. When is Jesus coming? When is Jesus coming? The disciple even asked Jesus, when are you coming? Jesus said, I don't know. Only the Father knows. My beloved ones, he has given us a timeline. He has given us that timeline, what's going to happen, what's going to happen before he's coming. But we must live our life like as if he's coming today, coming any second. 
You were able to run and not go worry, brother. You will feel a renewed energy. So this Good Friday, as we step into Resurrection Sunday, may God energy come upon you. That's the reason why this is a good time to do a stock check of your Christian life. Do some stock check. How is your prayer life today? How is your sharing of God's word to people today? How is your giving life today? How is your relationship life today? How are you living your life today? It's a good time to do stock check. It is not just to worship God. It's a good time to do stock check. I just, I just heard about a message of a man said about worship, and I put it up on my Facebook. Worship is not how you sing. Worship is not how you just lift up your hand up and glorify God. Worship is when you know it is a sin, and you decided not to do it. That's worship. He gave an example when you know, when you're about to watch the pornography and that moment you stop and you say, I'm not watching the pornography. That is worship. Worship is when you know you can do it. You can do the wrong. You can do that accusation. You can do all those things. But you decide not to do it. That's worship. Worship is when you decide not to allow things to hold you down. That's where you worship God. And I think you got anger. You want to... Vomit on the person, but you decided not to do it. You got anger, you want to slap the person, but you decided not to do it. That's worship. When the guy said that, I said, yeah. How true is that? Amen? How true is that? And finally, he said, what? It is finished. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. What drink is this? This drink is, how are you? This is vinegar. And the sponge they gave to him in his mouth is used to wipe backside. That sponge is used to wipe backside, no? That is the sponge they put and dip it into the vinegar and gave it to him. How insulting that was. But Jesus there took that vinegar a little bit and said, ah, I can't handle it anymore. He took the pain of the world, he took the pain of the life, the pit of a people's life, the downcasted life. And so when I was preaching to India, I was talking to the people who are called the dialect. In Malaysia, we call them Faria. And I told them, listen, God is telling you, he loves you. On that cross, he took that bitter wine to let you know he's willing to touch your life if you're willing to open up your life to him. When I did that, the altar was filled up by this group of people who were giving their life to Jesus, saying only Jesus can help them. And he looked up and he said, it is finished. The word is tetelista. This word is tetelista. It is not just a word that is spoke by, it is a transition, a business transition. The Lord God Almighty was saying to his father, I have done the business. The business is done. See, finished. What is that business? The business of death. The business of sin. The business of grave is only done by Jesus. It's only done by Jesus. It is finished. The word we use in business there are three things that you must understand that happened on the cross of Calvary. The debt of sin is fully paid, number one. And the sentence of judgment that were deserved has been fully served. The sentence of judgment has fully served what Jesus is supposed to do, what we supposed to serve. Jesus took it on the cross of Calvary. It is done. And the sentence of judgment that were deserved to be fully served and the battle against the devil and sin and all the sickness and all the disease and all the violence and all the struggle and pain, the battle that we fought has already been won by Jesus on the cross of Calvary. That's why he say it is finished. Finish. It is finished. The death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ has put death to death. Has put death to death. Oh, it's finished. So you're going to fear to die. You shouldn't be afraid. That's why I really like Brother Ho when I was speaking to him in his last days. I said, brother, how you feel? He said, I'm ready to go. I said, you're not afraid? No, I'm not. I want to go back. I'm ready to go. I said, no, afraid for death? No, I'm no more. I'm ready to go. And just in one month, God took him home. Because he was ready to meet his maker for heaven and earth. And I see many men who come to a point in their life and say, listen, death doesn't worry me anymore. Because I'm seeing my maker. First Corinthians chapter 5, 15, 55, 57 says this. Oh, death. Where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the sting of sin is law. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is law. But thanks be to God which gave us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, the devil wants to come and kill you. 
the law and the system want to disqualify you. But Jesus said, I'm the one who redeemed you. I'm the one who restore you. I'm the one who make you strong. So why Good Friday is called good? Let me leave behind these five simple thoughts very quickly. Number one, redemption through sacrifice. Because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, we receive redemption. Number two, victory over sin and death. That cross is a victory over your sin and over your death. And of course, number three is the fulfillment of the prophecy. If you read the whole Bible, you can find the prophecy of Jesus on the cross of Calvary and how you and I redeemed by that. And number four, reconciliation with God. What is broken is reconciled again. What's broken, God put us back again with his Father in heaven. And number five, he demonstrates to us God's love. These are five simple truths you must remember about Good Friday. And there's reason why they call it Good Friday. Amen? And let me close by this wonderful quote. I picked it up while I was doing my reading. And I like this quote. He came to pay a debt. He did not owe because he owe because we owe a debt we could not pay. He came to pay a debt he did not owe because we owe a debt which we could not pay. Oh, you have a debt in your life that only he can pay for us. Amen? So we're going to come to the communion right now in our closing. And I get a musician to come up as we sing together this song. Um, come. Come, sister. Thank you, Jesus. Father, Lord, we praise you. Oh, we bless you, Lord Jesus. We say thank you, Lord. Come and stand up to your feet right now. Actually, I want to put up the movie of Jesus in the last few hours of his journey before he went to the cross of Calvary. I want to put that up. But somebody told me don't do that because that is going to stir emotion. I want to let you know, brothers and sisters, we are living in a day that emotion shouldn't be the one that leads us to come to Jesus. We must be sure. We must be certain that he is the answer of our faith. That he is the way and the truth. I come to Jesus because I trust him. He's everything to me. I shouldn't be stirred by any movies. I shouldn't be stirred by any story. Because in the last days, the devil will come and cheat you and lie to you by telling you stories that does not mean a lot in the scripture. We must do it clearly unto God. So when you come before God today in this Good Friday, you must remember that Jesus loves you very much. As you heard the whole scripture, as you read the whole story today, you know he cared for you very much. It's not emotion. It's you are sure that Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. You are certain. Nothing will turn me. Even the devil can come and tell me something else, but my faith will be still in the Lord. Even my family can say something else. Even my friends can say something else. But my faith is still in the Lord. I'm not going to allow things to hold me down. Because in these last days, the devil will come to tempt the body of Christ. And to derail your faith. To derail your call. To sabotage you. The enemy will come to sabotage you. That's what the Bible says. In the last days, there will be sheep in a wolf's clothing. Oh, they are coming to cheat, to steal, to lie, to deceive. So they can do whatever the devil wants them to do. My dear brothers and sisters, this whole journey of Good Friday, we see light of God dealing with darkness. We see the presence of God dealing with the presence of evil. That victory on the cross of Calvary reminds us that Jesus loves you and loves me. Amen. Let's worship God with this song even as you prepare for this communion. Come on. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, we bless you, Lord. Go ahead, sister. Thank you.
of Jesus, where you are right now, just allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. Why Good Friday is good is because of redemption through sacrifice. We heard the whole scripture, we heard all the story of Jesus, how he came to this world because the Lord knows nothing else can help us today besides Jesus dying on the cross of Calvary. No man, no human no human involvement, no human position or title can actually come to save us. As the Lord was speaking to Zerubbabel, the Lord says, it is by my spirit, not by power of man, not by wisdom of man, not by strength of man, but by my spirit, says the Lord. As we stand before the Lord right now, as you hold the cup in your hand, as you hold the bread in your hand, I just want you to take some time in this very moment to look at your life and see how the Lord has redeemed you to his sacrifice of the cross of Calvary. Come on, just take some moment and say, Lord, I thank you. I think you should do that. Because I am a sinner, Lord. I know myself better than anyone else know. Maybe outside people see the good thing of my life. Maybe outside people see the very best of my life. But I know who I am. I know how, how broken I am. And I know how ugly I can become. And I know how bad I can become. And I know how small I can become. And I know how lonely I can become. So Lord, today I come to you, Lord. I know, but I'm redeemed by your precious blood. I say thank you for the sacrifice of the cross of Calvary that you lift my head up. When my life was all no good, but you gave me goodness through your precious blood. When my life was heading to all stop sign, but you opened up the door of blessing, oh God. When my life is hindered by all kind of lies, by your holy presence cover me, your precious blood protected me, your Holy Spirit lead me on to the green pasture, to the quiet water where I can enjoy the moment with you, Lord. Lord, I know I'm redeemed by you and your sacrifice has set me free. Oh, Lord, I say thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Father, Lord, praise you, Lord. Lord, I say thank you, Lord, that victor, victory has come over my life, over sin and death. Lord, I stand before you, Lord, I know there are times in my life death would have overtaken me. Lord, I know in my journey, Lord, there are death would have come and take me away, but you have poured your love upon my life, and no sin, no death covers me, Lord, today. And I say thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Lord, I say thank you for the fulfillment of all the prophecy in the book. In the scripture, Lord, everything they said about you have come to pass. And now, Lord, we are waiting for one to come to pass. Where the angel of God told the disciples, in the same way you lifted up, in the same way you were written back. Lord, there's one more prophecy now we are waiting for. You're coming back again. You're coming back again. Everything has been accomplished. And now is to see you coming back again the same way you went, O oh Father. So, Lord Jesus, we pray for your hand of mercy upon our life. Lord, we say thank you for reconciling us with God, where sin has divided us, where sin has broken us, where sin has hindered us to come in your presence, O oh Father. But through your Son, Jesus, we have freedom to call you Abba, Father. And to the Son, Jesus, we have the freedom to enter into the holy presence of God and worship you and glorify you. And Father, Lord, thank you that you showed your love to us. Even in our weakness, in our brokenness, oh Father, Lord, you come to pick us up. And thank you, Lord, for demonstrating the love of God over our life. And this whole journey of Good Friday, Lord, we see how much you love us. How much you love us. Lord Jesus, we surrender our life into your hand today. Use us for the glory of God. As we stand before you, as we hold the bread in our hand, as we hold the cup in our hand, we are reminded of oh God today that promise that you are coming back with us to partake of this communion together with us in the great banquet. As for now, Lord, we are remembering your body. And this broken body, Lord, it is not meant to be wasted. This broken body, Lord, is to mend healing. 
men heart, men mind. And Lord, we know the things that you have done and wrong that we have done. Today we come to you and ask for that forgiveness. Forgive us, God, if the word that we have spoken that has hurt the body of Christ. Forgive us, God, the word we have spoken if it hurt someone. Forgive us today, Lord, and you will bring your healing over our life. And as we partake of this broken body, Lord, we remember that you will heal us today. On the night before the Lord was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, let's break it together. And he said, take it in remembrance of me, let's all partake of this bread together. Hallelujah. Come on. We need God's healing. Call upon God's healing. Come on, stand up. Someone that you know of. The healing, the need of healing of God. Come on, lift up, brother. Go to the hand of God. Come on. Lift up those people who need the touch of God. You know their name. Lift up Esther. Lift up those who need God's healing. Come on, lift up your hand up and say, God, thank you. As I partake of this bread, Lord, I receive you my healing. I receive my restoration. I receive my deliverance. I receive, Lord God, my breakthrough. Lord, I pray for brother Go right now in hospital. May the hand of grace be upon his life. As we stand together as a body of Christ, we stretch our hand before him right now in the hospital, Lord. Even as he takes time to rest, Lord, we ask your ministering angel to go forth and minister to him. Minister to brother Go right now. Every fear be gone in Jesus' name. Every fear be crippled in the name of Jesus. And we pray for the doctors that are going to do surgery on him. Lord, let the wisdom of God be upon them. Yes. But from now to the surgery, Lord, we believe for miracles to take place. Yes. From now to surgery, God, we believe that he is healed by your precious blood. Yes. So in your hand, we release him, O oh Father. And we release all our brothers and sisters from all well in the body. Touch them, heal them. Lord, if there are some among us that do reconcile relationship, oh God, let there be a reconciliation, oh God. Let there be restoration, oh God. Let there be deliverance, oh God. And as we hold the cup in our hand, oh, we remind you of your precious blood that broke every sin. That brought every iniquity, every transgression. As we hold the cup in our hand, we are reminded once again, oh Father, your mercy endures forever. So, Father, we say thank you for this cup. Thank you for this cup. I want to do something special today, right? To find somebody and say this to the person. Come on, find someone and say, this cup is my Savior's blood. And I'm your, I'm your friend, I'm your brother, I'm your sister. And I want to exchange this cup to you to remind you the redemption of God's grace over your life. Come on, you say it your way. Or whatever you want to say, say it your way. Right? Say it your way. How you want to say it? I want you to exchange a cup. To your, exchange a cup with your friend, your brother, your sister. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come, brother. As you exchange a cup, the Lord remind you we are not alone. Amen? We are not alone in this journey. Hallelujah. We are not alone in this journey. We are together in this journey. And we exchange a cup and try and tell the person, your Jesus is my Jesus. Your Lord is my Lord. Your Savior is my Savior. Huh? Come on, lift up your cup in the hand of the Lord. Say, Lord, thank you for this cup, Lord. As I partake this cup, Lord, I want to be the ambassador. I want to be the voice. I want to be the hand of healing, the mouth of healing, the mouth of encouragement, the hand of encouragement. So, Father, bless this cup even as I partake it, O Father. Amen. On the night before the Lord was betrayed, he blessed the cup. He said, take it in the remembrance of me. Let's all partake of this cup together. Come on, lift up your hand to the Lord even as we sing the worship song once again. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lift up your hand to the Lord. Just lift up and give thanks. Nobody ever the cup, put it aside. Just lift up your hand to the Lord for a moment. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Just for a while, all right? Just sing this song and you're close. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. We adore you. Lord, we praise you. The song is coming. Sing it.
Thank you. 